Good afternoon, everyone. Are we ready to get started? Members of our governor's council are here and accounted for. Terrific. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lieutenant Governor Kim Driscoll, and I'd like to welcome everyone to this hearing on the cannabis misdemeanor possession pardon announced by Governor Healy on March 13th, 2024. And I will begin by reading the transmittal letter for the pardon that was sent by the governor to the governor's council. Dear counselors, pursuant to Article 7 of Section 1 of Chapter 2, of part of the second of the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts as amended by Article 73 of the amendments of the Constitution, I submit for your advice and consent my decision to pardon all adult persons who, on or before the date of this letter, have been convicted of the misdemeanor of possession of marijuana, including under Mass General Laws, Chapter 94C, Section 34. Sincerely, Maura T. Keeley. And now that we know what, they, what we're here for, I'd like to begin by introducing you to the members of the Governor's Council. And maybe I'll just ask members to introduce themselves starting all the way at the right, and then we can just move move all the way through with uh, Councilor Ionella. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Christopher Ionella. Good afternoon, I'm Marilyn Petito. Good afternoon, Joe Ferreira. Good afternoon, good afternoon Tara Jacobs. Paul DePaulo of Worcester. Terry Kennedy from Winfield. Eileen Duff from Gloucester. All right, now that everyone is present and accounted for, um, we can go ahead and get started with respect to witnesses. Just thought we would set some of the ground rules. Uh, there are six witnesses who will be here today uh, testifying and they appear, they'll appear in the following order. We have a location for witnesses to join us so that we can hear clearly from them. First would be Suffolk County District Attorney Kevin Hayden. Uh, number two would be the City of Newton Chief of Police John Carmichael Jr. Uh, our third uh, witness would be Mr. Daniel Vasquez. Our fourth is our attorney Pauline Carrion, and our fifth is Representative Carlos Gonzalez. Uh, we're also provided an opportunity for individuals to provide written testimony in support or in opposition to what is before us. As of this morning, we've received one individual's written testimony and a request to testify from a Mr. Ron Ikebuchi, um, who we anticipate will be appearing remotely via WebEx. We do not anticipate any other witnesses. If there is anyone else in the room who wishes to speak, who has not let us know that they want to be heard, please identify yourself now to staff at the door. I think we've got staff at the door. <laughs> yes, we do. Okay, right there. We, we, oh, right outside, the table outside. Thank you. Um, and we'll do our best to accommodate you uh, coming before us. We did specifically invite representatives of the trial court and the probation department to give us their perspective today. Chief Heidi Brieger submitted a very helpful letter by way of uh, written testimony. I'd like to read that into the, I'd like to read that exchange into the record um, as a means of ensuring that it's part of our hearing. Just bear with me for one minute. <clears throat> Got those here. Okay. So they're a little long, but I do think they in include important information for both members of the council and anyone else who may be joining us this afternoon. Um, so the first letter is um, from Chief Ber to Chief Berger, um, to Chief Brieger, apologies, from um, from Paige Scott Reed, the governor's legal counsel. It says, Dear Chief Justice Brieger, I'm writing to invite you or a member of your staff to give testimony at a hearing before the governor's council at noon tomorrow, April 3rd, 2024, regarding the governor's decision to pardon all adult persons who, on or before the date of March 13th, 2024, have been convicted of the misdemeanor of possession of marijuana, including under MGL chapter 94C, section 34. The hearing will take place in room 157 at the state house. As part of this hearing, the governor's council is eager to hear the views of the trial courts in the office of the commissioner of probation. In particular, the council would like to better understand, one, the work that the trial courts and probation would undertake to update individuals' records should the governor's council consent to the pardon. Two, whether the trial court supports or has any concerns about the practical impact of granting this pardon. And three, whether the probation department supports or has any concerns about the practical impact of granting the pardon. The governor's office is grateful for the collaboration we have already received from you and your staff as we prepare the granting of this historic pardon. More particularly, as previously discussed, the governor's office has created an online form that people will be able to complete to request a pardon certificate. We plan to review these forms against information provided by trial courts and probation to confirm that those who complete these forms are eligible. Once the governor's office has ascertained that someone is eligible for a pardon certificate, 
the governor's office will formally confirm to the trial courts and probation that the individual has received a pardon and request that your team update the individual's criminal records. Both the trial courts and the governor's office expect this will be a months long effort. In addition, the trial courts and probation have expressed uh, the willingness to furnish to the governor's office lists of those who may be impacted by this pardon based on the trial court's electronic records. The governor's office will in turn review these lists, identify those convictions that have been pardoned, and instruct the trial courts to update its records accordingly. Again, both the trial courts and the governor's office expect that this effort will require substantial time and proceed at a deliberate pace. We are appreciative of your partnership and eager to begin this important work together. The governor's council is understandably eager to hear your perspective on these important topics as it prepares to complete its task of providing advice and consent. Please do not hesitate to reach out with any concerns. And again, I'll ask you to bear with me. I do want to read uh, the trial court's response, Justice Breaker's response. They were not able to be here this afternoon, but I think uh, this responds to many of the information points that folks were eager to hear from. Dear Attorney Scott Reed, I thank you for your invitation to testify at the governor's council hearing on April 3rd, 2024, regarding the governor's decision to pardon certain adult misdemeanor possession of marijuana charges. For the past several weeks, we have been planning for the potential need to update court records should the governor's council approve this pardon. There has been productive collaboration between the trial court staff, the mass probation service, and your office to establish the parameters and protocols for the governor's anticipated pardon. Trial court clerks and MPS staff understand their responsibility to update their respective records. We have agreed that such updates will be undertaken at a deliberate pace in the ordinary course upon request from the governor. Neither the trial court nor MPS takes a position on the practical impact of the governor's proposed pardon, except to say that if approved, we can take the necessary next steps to effectuate the pardon on our respective records without undue burden. As we understand the process, the trial court will provide a list generated from its electronic records of approximately 22,000 adult cases containing one or more misdemeanor possession of marijuana convictions that may be eligible for the governor's pardon. The governor's office will use the list in two ways. One, to review individual cases and make eligibility determinations for pardons, and two, to verify information submitted to the governor's office by individuals requesting a pardon certificate. In both instances, the governor's office will provide to the trial court and MPS on a reasonably paced and ongoing basis the information pertaining to individuals the governor's office has determined are eligible for a pardon. MPS and trial court clerks will update their records accordingly. In light of the extensive coordination among us and in view of the fact and in view of what I anticipate will be a routine undertaking incorporated into our day to day operations, I respectfully decline your kind invitation to testify testify before the governor's council. The trial court and MPS are grateful for the governor's appreciation of the work necessary to implement this effort and it is signed by Heidi Brieger, chief justice of the trial court. Um, so <clears throat> let me get that underway. And as I mentioned, um, as of now, we have one person, Mr. Ron Ikabuchi, who has submitted written testimony. He will testify via WebEx today. I will certainly let you know if anyone else um, signs up during this pro process. And with that, um, I think we'll begin taking testimony. We'd ask that all witnesses keep their remarks brief so that everyone can have an opportunity to be heard. And if, um, if you go over five minutes, we'll try and remind you nicely. Um, <laughs> about uh, the length of time of your remarks. So first, I'd like to invite Suffolk County District Attorney Kevin Hayden to testify and appreciate you being here today, DA. Thank you, uh, Lieutenant Governor, and uh, good afternoon to uh, all the members of the Governor's Council. And it's uh, good, to, uh, good to see you again, um, and particularly in, in light of what we're here to uh, uh, talk about and address today. Um, my name is Kevin Hayden. I am the district attorney for Suffolk County. Um, district attorney um, Anthony Galuni, who is the president of the Massachusetts District Attorneys Association, uh, could not be here today. He had uh, uh, another uh, matter that he absolutely had to be present for. Otherwise, uh, I think he would have been here. Um, I am here um, in his stead um, to express my own support and the support of the Massachusetts District Attorneys Association for Governor Healy's and Lieutenant Governor Driscoll's proposal to pardon marijuana misdemeanor convictions. The Massachusetts District Attorney Association stands with the governor and Lieutenant Governor 
on issuing pardons for those who were convicted of simple possessory marijuana offenses before these same charges were de decriminalized uh, by the legislature. This step will deliver fairness and equity for those whose mis minor crimes came before legislative action, and in so doing, will allow people to move forward with their lives without the burden of a conviction for something that is now entirely lawful. Massachusetts voters have consistently voiced their opinion on marijuana and its statutory status, from decriminalizing marijuana possessed in 2008 to legalizing medical marijuana in 2012, and then to full marijuana legislation in 2016. Massachusetts changed state laws around marijuana possession, and this proposal is based on the simple premise of fairness and equity, that a person should not bear the mark of conviction for an offense that is no longer a state crime. It is now also up to us to recognize completely justifiable retractive steps necessary to reflect those changes. When you look at the historical racial inequities in convictions for marijuana convictions, the rationale for a blanket pardon for marijuana possession becomes all the more compelling. Governor Healy's misdemeanor pardon proposal presents not only an appropriate and reasonable step, but a necessary one. It's important to note that the governor's proposal would allow only um, uh, pardon for simple marijuana convictions, misdemeanor possession, possession of offenses. The pardon would not have an impact on more serious offenses, such as marijuana trafficking. It would not apply to all other charges accompanying the simple possession conviction. For instance, if a person were convicted of an armed robbery and marijuana possession, the pardon would apply only to the possession charge. The Massachusetts District Attorney Association stands in full support of Governor Healy's proposal. Thank you. Thank you, DA Hayden. Thank you for your testimony. And I'll give counselors an opportunity to ask questions of the witness. Are there any questions? I see counselors raised. Thank you for coming, Mr. District Attorney. My pleasure. Um, I have a couple of concerns. I started to address one with you before we started. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I noted from your testimony, you talked about the fact that it was for misdemeanor possession, not trafficking. Mm -hmm. But we have something in between possession with intent marijuana. There's a lot of people that were convict convicted of possession with intent marijuana, which is a misdemeanor as well, that um, sold very tiny amounts of marijuana that convicted, that were convicted of it, that has a huge impact on their lives and ability to get jobs. My question for you is, well, I applaud the governor for, for the possession uh, fund. <clears throat> Does it go far enough? Shouldn't shouldn't we have a bigger reach and, and reach out to those situations where uh, people are convicted simp uh, simply of possession with intent? And you've seen it in your career as a prosecutor, where people sold small amounts of marijuana and ended up with that conviction. Where, frankly, I can walk into a dispensary right now and someone's going to sell it to me. That's what they were doing. It's not a crime anymore. So my qu first question to you is. Do you think this pardon goes far enough? I, uh, 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 Mr. Kennedy, I think it strikes the the appropriate balance. Possession with intent to distribute marijuana now is still legal. Uh, that's still a crime. That's still a crime that we can charge. That's still a crime that can be punished. Um, and and but, the, but practically speaking, it's not. There's very few cases that are brought for that. This well. Stage. I, I, I'm out there, and I don't, and I, and I don't know the numbers on that for sure. But I, I know, I know it's still legal. I know it's still a charge that 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 we can bring. Mm -hmm. The reality is, we 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 can't and don't bring uh, possession for marijuana charges anymore. And if you go back historically and look as well, and th and these people would apply here. There's been cases in the past, um, uh, countless. I couldn't begin to tell you how many, probably, but people who have been charged with possession with intent to distribute, who under appropriate circumstances had those those offenses broken down to straight possession. So I think it's the right balance. I think it's the appropriate balance. I think it'd be very difficult for us to start parsing out the possession with intent to distribute cases that should uh, be pardoned and those which shouldn't. And I think that's what we would be engaged in if we had to take a look at that. Here's my second question and my second concern, which I started with you, in which um, 
Judge Briga touched upon in her letter. I'm disappointed if no one's here from probation because I was going to direct this towards them. But my understanding from the case law, uh, and the SJC came down with a decision on this, I believe, two or three years ago, um, that what the only thing this pardon does is put a note on their record that they have been pardoned. It does not take it off their criminal record. If, I, if somebody gets a copy of their records, an employer or something, it's still going to say that they were convicted of possession of marijuana and then pardoned. Do you think we should be taking another step in <clears throat> expungement? It might take legislation, but uh, I don't think that this solves people's problems where we're leaving this. I don't necessarily just that point. Um, uh, and nor would I be opposed to the additional step, but that's a, a larger question for a different day, I think. <clears throat> okay. And then finally, my my last concern that was raised was from Judge Briga's letter. I haven't seen the letter, but I heard Lieutenant Governor read it. I was paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> um, is they were 2,000 electronic um, folks that are on the electronic system. The number that I've been hearing kicked around with this pardon is between 69,000 and 100,000. Don't you think we should be making more of an effort to find those other people and who they are? So most people that have a marijuana conviction don't know what's going on in this room today <laughs> and never will, okay? They're not going to get on a portal and fill out a form to get a pardon document. They're not going to um, uh, be writing on a job application that they've been pardoned because they're never going to know it unless we reach out somehow. Mm -hmm. Don't you think we should be doing more? We should be doing as much as possible, I think. And I, I I don't mean to be glib, but thankfully that's a problem I don't have to worry about. That's for the governor or probation office to worry about. But we should be making it, and we expressed this concern at the time that the issue was raised. It should be as automatic as possible. We cannot um, and should not expect uh, every person to uh, proactively take the steps to get the pardon. It should be automatic. We should be searching the databases um, and using the best of our IT resources and the best resources available to us uh, to identify the cases ourselves and and to make uh, the pardons automatic. And as far as I understand, the, the governor's office is in complete agreement on that on that issue. Well, I appreciate your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Other members, I, I know that um, Councillor Jake. Thank you for coming and thank you for sharing what you did. I really appreciate it. Um, I have a question. I, I don't know that you're the right place to ask about, but I'm going to ask of you. And if it turns out this is not necessarily, you know, an area that you can speak to, then I'll ask again. Mm -hmm. uh, and I will also just, uh, I think it's well known I'm not a, an attorney. And so these are areas that I'm learning about. And so mm -hmm. I will express it correctly. But some of the feedback I have received um, in my district is around concern about people who have a continuation without a finding. And so um, through the magic of Google uh, and diving into where that concern is coming from, it seems to me the concern is around when there's been a continuation without a finding, it, you have to plead guilty. Is that correct? Um, and that the it, it still counts as a first offense in the event that you were to be more, you know, come back in uh, on some other offenses. You've, now it's your second offense. Um, and so my question, so, so far, am I, am I correct in understanding the basic nature of what continuation without a finding suggests? I, I feel, correct me if I'm wrong, because I do want to understand. Yeah, that. basically, but when a continuous without, when you, you admit to a continuous without a finding, you are, you're not, you're not pleading guilty. Um, you're admitting to uh, sufficient facts to potentially have a finding of guilty enter, but you, that that finding is not actually made. So it's a little different. Well, okay, so tell me. I think, but right? your I think your question is whether or not I, I think so the heart of what you're trying to get is if we're going to if we're going to pardon convictions, how are we not pardoning continuance without a finding? That's right. My number one question. It is, that is my number one question. No. Yeah. I, it's 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 a fair one, and I and I know that that that's not contemplated in this proposal, mostly because how do you pardon someone for something that they weren't convicted of? Because a continuance without a finding is not a conviction, right? We pardon convictions. The governor has the authority to pardon convictions. I don't think, as far as I know, the governor does not have the authority to pardon something that's not a conviction. A continuance without a finding. Um, so there are probably other solutions to that, which I think we need to take a close look at. Um, and we won't take a close look at. Um, 
so that the <laughs> equity and fairness that we talk about when it comes to doing this in the first place applies to everybody. I appreciate that. You know what? I had other questions, but you really, in a nutshell, that's the heart of where my right. concerns were. And so I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Fer Ferreira. Thank you. Thank you, DA. So we all come from different backgrounds. I was a police officer for 30 years. I've been a lawyer for 30 years. I've been a special prosecutor. I've been a defense lawyer. So I've seen different sides of everything, I think. Um, and I agree with you that um, there was a lot of discretion on when I was on the job, and there is now. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you get the right cop, and you just threw the you join on the ground. And other times, if you were a particular pain in town, you might have got locked up for a seed. Mm -hmm. So um, there was different discretion. And also, um, there were many cases where someone was charged, initially charged with intent to distribute or trafficking, and they rolled on somebody, or the cop didn't show up, or they went to the right DA, they got locked, locked up in the right county, and someone's more lenient than others. So they ended up with a simple marijuana possession case. Do you agree with that? I do. Okay. Do you think this um, pardon would um, pardon school zone cases? Well, possession with Distributing the school zone, no, it would not cover that, right? This is always straight possession. So the mm -hmm. possession of marijuana in the school zone, there's no such charge, right? Um, so it, it's, it's school, school zone charges that uh, a company of possession with intent to distribute um, don't don't come into play here, no. Because sometimes, and, and I'll agree that uh, for somebody to enter a school zone before they made the stop. Did you see that happen in your career? You know, someone's got drugs on them. You just wait till they get in the school zone. Stop them. Yeah. Well, look, I got to uh, be very frank and honest with you in my experience. And that's always been in Suffolk County. Everywhere in Suffolk County is within a, a thousand feet of a school zone. That was part of the, the gripe right. with school right. zones in Suffolk County at the time. Right. So that that hasn't been my experience. No. Right. Um, but certainly if that happened or or. Um, is happening, that's a significant issue. And when you speak to prosecutors, I think the vast majority that I know anyway, um, we weren't looking for convictions on these cases back in the day. I think the vast majority got quashed. Would you agree with that? Continue without a findings? That I don't know for sure. I, 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 if, I, if I spoke to that, it would be uh, it would be without all the information. And if they did get a quaff, like Council Jacobs was talking about, it's an admission of sufficient facts, and it's dismissed after, after a period of time. And with the new law about expungement, they can get that expunged without a pardon. Is that your understanding? That's my understanding, yes. Thank you, sir. And Appreciate I think that's why we need to look at how we address the pardon issue that you raise in, in, insofar as it s still shows, right? Maybe a blanket expungement as well. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor DePaula? Thank you. Thank you for being here, Mr. Sure. I just want to follow up on the question that my colleague, Council Carroll, was asking. Can you turn my microphone off? Uh, and it's a point of curiosity for me. So, with the intent to distribute in a school zone, as you noted in Suffolk County, it's nearly impossible to be not in a school zone, right? Mm -hmm. And in the 61 cities and towns that I represent, there's many where it would be almost impossible to be in a school zone, as opposed to in Worcester, where, like Suffolk County, mm -hmm. it would be difficult. It, it seems to be commonly agreed to that um, one of the benefits of this pardon or one of the outcomes of the war on drugs was a disproportionate impact on communities of color. Would you say that's true? I would definitely say that's true, yes. And I'm wondering if the school zone issue also wildly disproportionately impacts communities of color for the reasons that we were just speaking of. I personally would say that it does. Um, but I appreciate your comment earlier regarding intent to distribute. It's, it would be difficult to parse out which ones which ones are eligible, um, or which ones would be meritorious of a, of a pardon. Um, but I think it's something worth considering. I also wanted to ask you while you're here. Times change as they and societal standards change as they have with cannabis. Are there other crimes uh, that have changed? or laws that have changed that you think would merit consideration, at least, for blanket pardons or blanket commutations? Hmm. Wasn't expecting that question, um, but we can tell. Yeah, there, <laughs> there probably are. I can offer an example. Uh, I can offer an example, too. I know I, I, I support the uh, decriminalization of prostitution for women. Um, 
may we, if, we, if that happens, I think then we got to look long and hard at whether or not we pardon that as well. Given what we know about that, given what we know um, about the effect that it has um, on women, how they're trafficked, and given how that also disproportionately impacts uh, people of color, that would be certainly be something that I can think of. What was your example? Thank. First of all, I agree with you, Mr. D District Attorney. Uh, and second of all, I'm thinking of something that has come before the council before, and that is folks who've been convicted under joint venture theory of first degree murder when they're not the principal actor. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if a blanket commutation for those folks, which would not exonerate them, but would give them the opportunity to seek a, a parole hearing, whether that um, whether that would be appropriate. Yeah, I, th that would get, uh, frankly, that gets a little more difficult, in my opinion, and based on my experience as a, both a prosecutor and defense attorney. Um, I think it's why the legislature, why I'm sorry, not why the SJC uh, uh, fell uh, short of going retroactively when it comes to the joint venture theory, because who knows how a case would have been presented with the law being different. Sure. Um, but I do think that there would certainly be <clears throat> appropriate circumstances where uh, a joint venture uh, case should be uh, pardoned and or expunged, yes. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Thanks, Councillor DePaul. Any other questions, Councillor Devan? Yeah, it's it really doesn't amplify. I think it's only meant for digitally. So you're thank you for coming. To My that. pleasure. This is a little off subject, but it was brought up about the school uh, zone law, and um, I'm really concerned about that because um, the judge has no discretion, and um, and it, it should be changed. I believe, and only from my experience that I voted for a pardon years back. And um, uh, the man have to be 56 years old. And um, he, when he was 17, he was on his way to school. And um, an older woman, 20 years old, stopped him and said, would you do me a favor? Would you sell these bags of marijuana? He gave him five. And innocent, innocent kid, good student, good son, never was in, any type of criminal activity. He was so naive. He took the five bags and he went into school and he sold one. And when he tried to sell the next one, that student went to the office and reported him. So he went, he went to prison. So he lost the scholarship, couldn't play sports, didn't go to college. He lost his youth, really. And so, um, it seems to me that a judge should use discretion. I, I can't believe that someone who is a drug dealer who is going into a school zone selling drugs is in the same position as this young man. And I'm just wondering, I know it's off topic, but I don't have a chance to talk to you. Is there any way that that can be changed, that the judge can use discretion on an individual basis? Well, only if you may move the mandatory minimum requirement for schools on offense, right? Um, we, this is far afield from why we're here today. Um, but I guess what I would say to the the overarching concerns around the school zone charge is that they're, they're rightfully placed. And the reason they're rightfully placed is because I, I don't think it takes a rocket scientist to figure out that the underlying original intent of the school zone offense was to prevent someone from dealing drugs within a school zone while school was in session that would impede um, students and, and faculty and the like during school zone hours, when the reality is, is that is not the time and the place where, where these sorts of offenses tend to occur. So if you go back to the underlying legislative intent for why the school zone um, statute was put into place in the first place, and I think that's why, um, everything derives from that. All of the issues around the school zone related charge derive from that because there's no limitation on the time frame in which someone can be charged for distribution within a school zone. Some would argue that that's the way it should be, that we want school zones to be free from drug distribution at any and all times, 24-7, 365. Um, that's a debatable question, but that it's that underlying legislative intent that gives rise to all these questions. Thank you. Any other questions for members of the council? 
Seeing none. Thank you, DA Hayden. Appreciate you being here. Thank you. Sharing your testimony. And thank you all. You won't Thanks. be safe for another three hours. <laughs> I plan. I plan to. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, DA. Uh, next up, we have Chief John Carmichael from the city of Newton. Appreciate you being here. Thanks for having me. Good morning. Good afternoon. I <laughs> Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, some excellent questions already being raised and uh, certainly. A lot of that is uh, as law enforcement. We've also considered. Um, relative to this pardon. I want to mention that on um, March 13th, when uh, Governor Healy held the press conference, the Mass Chiefs of Police Association supported Governor Healy and her administration in pardoning prior simple marijuana possession offenses. Um, this didn't come without controversy. Um, Mass Chiefs did decide to support this, but um, the controversy among law enforcement um, was not a consensus, but still we feel that it's the right thing to do based on the circumstances. Um, and as mentioned earlier, we don't believe that it minimizes the fact that other crimes may have been committed at the time um, when we're just solely focusing on simple possession. Um, Governor Healy's pardon provides a fair and just response to prior convictions and aligns these convictions with the current laws of the Commonwealth. And as we know, um, in 2008, when we decriminalized marijuana, this would um, align all of the people that were um, charged and convicted of those crimes with the current law that we have now, um, where people can possess an ounce or less of marijuana in, um, out in public, and, and even with the, the, the up to two ounces being decriminalized. Um, it helps though, uh, those whose lives were previously impacted by simple marijuana possession offenses. And it provides a fair and impartial response to prior misdemeanor marijuana offenses. Some of the items that were talked about so far, the expungement um, in 2020, uh, 2022, the uh, Senate 3096, an act relative to equity in the cannabis industry under Section 23, it did allow the expungement of marijuana possession offenses as long as they were uh, within the um, the the scope of decriminalization, um, but that expungement law does also extend to possession with intent to distribute. So where the, the governor is pardoning um, solely simple possession of marijuana um, pursuant to the amounts from decriminalization, the expungement law does actually extend beyond that to possession with intent to distribute. So, and that law says that you shall expunge those records. So this is why um, we don't have such a big issue with this is because we're pardoning something that you, you shall have expunged regardless. Um, I will say that that law needs to be addressed still because if we uh, say that you can have a, a prior conviction of marijuana possession with intent to distribute expunged, um, as a DA mentioned, uh, that is still, it's still illegal in Massachusetts to, to um, distribute mm -hmm. any amount of marijuana without a, a license from the Cannabis Control Commission. So there's a little bit of a discrepancy in that law that we need to fix. Uh, I also say that during my remarks uh, on March 13th, I did note the so-called war on drugs. Um, that originated back in the 1970s under President Nixon. And uh, that's when we declared drug abuse in and of itself as, as public enemy number one. And that's what started the system of enforcement and punitive um, actions against um, people for possession of drugs in the United States, including marijuana. Um, I will say that uh, I know the governor got asked this at uh, the conference, the press conference, um, that uh, how her thoughts were for decriminalization and legalization um, years ago, and and I shared those uh, same concerns. I was against decriminalization, uh, medical and uh, adult use marijuana for my own personal reasons. A lot of it is because of how it would impact our adolescence and, uh, you know, age of onset and then kids initiating at younger ages and um, impaired driving, uh, public safety matters, really, like that was, those were my concerns. I still have them today. Um, but I also, you know, I, a lot of times law enforcement gets a lot of the, um, the blame in some of the laws that we have. Um, law enforcement enforces the laws that we're provided mm -hmm. um, and nothing more. And 
I commend law enforcement and, and my colleagues for the role that they now play, the transformative and collaborative role that we play in um, the drug issues that, that, that affect our communities. And um, in modern day policing, we have shifted away from just using arrest as a means to deal with, with drug issues. We, we do much more outreach. We partner with all kinds of um, people, individuals, organizations, and um, while we look for ways to engage the community and work with people to deal with substance abuse or um, even substance use disorder in and of itself, we do still believe that relentless um, enforcement against people who distribute drugs in our community um, should be dealt with. Um, but I will say that um, on behalf of Mass Chiefs, uh, we do support the pardon um, as presented by the governor. <clears throat> thank you, Chief Carmichael. Questions from members of the commission? I saw Councillor Ferreira first. Thank you, Chief. Thank you for coming today. Um, it was nice chatting with you a little early. Um, and I do agree with you, and I'm glad you mentioned that uh, police do the jobs that they're, they take an oath for, right? Mm -hmm. And I know I don't look this old, but I went to the academy in 85. And, uh, you know, they showed us these videos about how heinous marijuana was back in the day. And they show you the cartels killing people and uh, beheading people and doing bad things. And like, hey, you know, you got to do your job and you got to enforce the law. So I'm glad you brought that up. Um, and I'm also glad I, like you, was against it um, until I had three teenage daughters who taught me better. Um, <laughs> and uh, and I come full circle. And I think we have a society. And that's why I'm in agreement with it, with this today. But uh, it was noteworthy what you said and how it's transitioned and how we have adjusted, I think, in a good way. So that, you know, making something criminal is not always the answer for societal problems. Mm -hmm. but thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I was very uh, vocal about these issues when they time and the way that um, I think helped me, you know, as as the uh, transition to reach, you know, decriminalization, medical, and then adult use was being a part of the system itself. So I was, I'm still a member of the Cannabis Advisory Board. I'm the law enforcement representative on there. So it was good to be able to be a part of uh, you know, the system that we have now and being able to make sure that we had the right public health and public safety measures in place um, as, as this thing is rolled out and continues to roll out. Thank you. Councillor Jacobs. Thanks. Coming. Thank you for all that you shared. I actually learned a lot listening to you and, and um, I just appreciate the, the way in which you addressed it, um, both sides of your thinking around it. And um, the question I have for you, and, and again, it may not, you may not be the right person to ask. Well, some of the questions I think is expungement versus pardon is something I'm working to understand better. I had been under the impression that when we were asked to give a pardon and we approved a pardon, that it was a clean slate, like a race that didn't exist. So I've only just recently learned that's not the case, that there's a notation to the charge that says pardoned. Um, Whereas expungement sounds like more like what I thought. So, okay, it's not the same thing. Yeah. Well, so I'm learning that, right? I'm learning that. So expungement, though, it sounds like is clearly gone, like fully scrubbed. Is that more what right. expungement? It, it, we've we've like? always had we've had an expungement law in Massachusetts for most recently back in 2022 is when they amended that ex, the expungement law to extend um, to focus on marijuana possession offenses, criminal um, convictions, as well as the um, intent. But despite distribute. the law, it's not an automatic thing, right? You've got to apply for it. You've got to you ask still have to apply for it. For but the, the law says that you shall, you know, that they shall issue the expungement once once the hearings take place, as long as it meets the criteria of being right. under the like eligible. The, yeah, what the decriminalization amounts are. So my question, I guess, for you in in law enforcement, if if we have a pardon um, that's noted, uh, there was this charge and the and a pardon, and you interact with someone um, in, in the act of, you know, doing your business mm -hmm. and see that notation. What, what's your, what, how do you handle seeing a, a crime with a pardon next to it? Do you talking about the police officer? Yeah. They, they're not going to, they, they probably won't pay much attention to it at all. Um, we have a different, we have different access. So it would have been like, it was, I think probation was invited, but probation we get access to border probation records. So when a police officer is running someone's, you know, information record in the street, they're getting border probation, which is 
any arraignment that that person may have had, regardless of if they were convicted or not. Um, okay. a, a quarry check, criminal offender record information is is different, which you know employers or somebody will have access to, but they only have access to convictions and only for a certain certain amount of times under our law. The quarry check does. Where did you see going all the way back? Quarry, yeah. Police will see all the way back. The police can see it going all the way back, right? So I guess, so my question, I guess, has to do with, you know, if you see a pardon, do you, do you take that pardon on as though it were, it had never happened and ignore it in terms of next offenses that you're considering this person may be engaging in, or is that still considered in some way? I guess I'm just trying to understand. Yes, that. yeah, you, you, you pray, you, you, if you see someone with pardon for a crime or it was an expungement or anything else, I don't, I don't think the police officer on the street takes any real, um, you know, note of that. So, okay. um, as uh, was mentioned earlier, the you know the police officer on the street has discretion. So, um, you know, could it weigh into the, their decision? Maybe, but it's each officer is going to have different discretion on how they handle a certain circumstance. I appreciate. It. Thank you for answering. Well, Councilor Kennedy. First of all, Chief, I appreciate what you do in the Newton Police Department. I've had a number of cases over the years with the Newton Police and. Certainly, run a very professional department. I really mean that sincerely. You have a lot of good uh, officers on there. Uh, I may have beaten one or two of them over the years, but they <laughs> still do a very good job and um, they work very hard and they're very professional. Uh, my point that I'm trying to make with respect to expungement versus pardon is just how overly burdensome it is yeah. for the individual if they want to get it expunged. Do you agree with me that we, with respect to? Okay, situations where it's supposed to be expunged if they ask it's a shell as you pointed out why aren't we just doing it period blanket what so the question is why are we doing something separate from yeah why aren't we doing it automatically why aren't we expunging it well we can um but that that you're not it up to the individual to actually petition the court and, and it's pretty what, burdensome. They have to bring it before a judge. They have to get would, an order yeah. of expungement. It has to get signed off by the probation yep. department in that court. It has to go to the commissioner's office. It takes a while. Most people don't even know they can do it, right? Right. They may not, yeah. Yeah, most people, the average person, if somebody was convicted of possession of possession with an intent to distribute 10 years ago, they probably have no idea. The 15 years ago, they probably have no idea they could get it off their records. Fair to say. I, I would say so, yeah. I mean, a lot of people that I've spoken to about it, um, they're not aware of it. And, you know, a lot yeah. of times, like, with anything like this, it's, you know, we'll give an example, like the hands-free law or something. You know, look, people still, well, I didn't know that we even change or we have hands-free law now. Yeah. Yeah. And so, like, it's, yeah, it's one of those things where, you know, at some level we should be... Um, advertising that or making why advertise it? why why doesn't this government just say the the commonwealth of Massachusetts would say you're entitled to have it expunged we're not talking about sailing which is very different mm -hmm. why aren't we just doing it get it off automatically yeah, i don't think so there's I'm anybody sure. that would say no to that you might yeah, say no to sailing for different reasons but expungement yeah, no, I agree. I agree. I agree with you that you know it's a it's a process. It's something the courts have to handle. It's something that and, and there's another whole issue that nobody's addressed when it comes to a record, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, if somebody was convicted convicted of possession of marijuana, well, you know what happened to their driver's license? Suspended. It got suspended, mm -hmm. and there's a whole registry record that has it on there. And a lot of jobs they want your registry of motor vehicle records, even if you got it expunged, even if you got it. Uh, Pardon, it's not going to show on there, and it's still going to be there. Do you think we should be doing something about I don't, that? I don't know if uh, if you run driver history right now, I and, and I, I could be wrong, but I don't believe that it still will show up on the RMV it shows that up. their license was suspended. That's a drug suspension. Okay. I, it, it could. I don't, I, I don't know. Okay. It shows up. Then I believe you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anything else, Councillor? No, thank you. Okay, Councillor Devaney, and thank then you. Councillor DePaulo. Nice to see you again. Well, fortunate the rest of the council is because I meet with you often and we talk often, so I don't have questions because I think I've asked you every question. Um, but I have to say publicly because I've said it to you, my nephew Bob, <clears throat> who lives in 
Walpole, where you came from, still angry with you that you left Walpole. So <laughs> I want to say that publicly. But, um, you know, I, I have to say you are present everywhere. And, and, um, and I'm glad you've taken this position. And um, I'm just so glad you're there and that you're always open for me to ask any questions and to everyone for that matter. But I thank you for coming and thank you for all you do. And uh, it's it's been some difficult times in Newton as soon as you came. And so I thank you for your service. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, Councillor. Any other questions from members of the council? Okay, seeing thank you, thank you Chief. Thank appreciate you, so you being much. here. Take care. Thanks. Um, next up, we've got uh, Daniel Vasquez. I see him all the time. Good to see you, Daniel. Thank you for joining us today. Also here at the announcement, appreciate you coming yes, back. Yes, I was. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, it's been a pleasure to, to speak here. Uh, so I'll I'll get right to it. My name is Daniel Vasquez, and I was convicted of um, marijuana possession as a juvenile. Um, while I am an uh, adult now with no cannabis convictions on my record. I am a proponent and an advocate for this pardon because although my trouble started when I was a juvenile and I had the fortunate experience of having great mentors to turn my life around, um, it did rear its ugly head when I was an adult, when I was particularly um, applying for very specific types of jobs. Um, you know, I was a criminal justice major at Northeastern University with a minor in political science. I had ambitions to join the foreign service. And um, when I applied for specific jobs that, um, no. you know, were, I guess, would you say more of like a federal background check, everything came up. Um, and my first opportunity to work for a federal agency here in Boston was um, short lived because of my juvenile record, unfortunately. Um, that led me to kind of course correct and really reevaluate what I want to do with the rest of my life um in terms of career path so uh that being said i i stopped applying to any federal type related jobs because i knew i just wasn't going to get it um even though i may have had all the qualifications and skills to um, add a lot of value to that agency unfortunately um it just wasn't something that i saw that was going to happen for me and so therefore i you know went to a different career path uh got into sales um today i am blessed to say that I have zero convictions on my adult record and I'm legally working in the cannabis industry. And um, now I can actually legally sell marijuana, which is <laughs> which is very funny, a full circle moment for me. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm in favor for this pardon because I know that there's other individuals that mm -hmm. were once in my position or are still currently in my position, whether they're 18, 19, and they had these convictions that perhaps have turned their life around and want to uh, join certain jobs and, and, and be a contributing member of society. And unfortunately, they're not going to be able to. Um, you know, there's also others who maybe want to get into the cannabis industry. And um, as an advocate for the cannabis industry here in Massachusetts, and to continue to see it flourish and attract top top level talent that some of our, you know, Fortune 500 companies have um, some of these individuals, unfortunately, may have some of these convictions on their record. So um, I'm a proponent for the bill because I think it'll attract more talent into the cannabis industry, help the industry here in Massachusetts flourish, um, and also give individuals an opportunity uh, to have a fair and equitable opportunity to change their lives and um, really just make a positive impact on, on Massachusetts. Um, that's really all I have on that subject. So if anyone has questions, please. Thank you, Mr. Vasquez. appreciate you being here. I see Councillor Ferreira who has his hand up and yeah, I just wanted to comment. Uh, thank you for being here. Testimony. I think it's crazy, crazy that any law enforcement agency um, would hold a possession of marijuana against a candidate for a job in law enforcement. So if things don't work out for you in the cannabis world, I would I would encourage you to apply to be a law enforcement officer. And there are big bonuses being paid right now, too. So you'd, you'd be very good at it, I can tell. I'll take a note of that. <laughs> Councilor Devaney? Uh, I just want to thank you for coming because actually you are the most important person to be speaking because you've lived it and you've walked the walk. So um, congratulations on what you've done and I wish you all good luck. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Any other questions from members of the council? 
Councillor Jacobs. Yeah, I, just, I want to echo thank you so much for coming and I very much appreciate you sharing your story. I have a question, but I don't know that it's actually it, it, it brings up a question, but I don't know that it's for you to answer, honestly. Uh, in the letter that we heard from Chief Justice Brager, um, mentioned 22,000 adult files. Is that mm -hmm. electronic? So we're records. talking about a juvenile situation, yes. like juvenile records. I'm just wondering if we're not talking about juvenile or if we, if it's an inclusive juvenile. I, I don't know who to ask this, honestly. Yeah. But um, I just want to understand are we, are we limiting this to adult files or would, you would fall within this part in as well as a juvenile holding record. We could probably have um, Adam answer that question because I think there are some technicalities with respect to how that how that um, how that needs to be answered depending okay. upon when when the uh, juvenile infraction occurred um, in particular. So, okay. any other questions for Mr. Vasquez? I'm very impressed by your testimony and the way in which Thank you. that is okay. Yeah. Thanks for being here again. Thank you so much. That. Okay. Thank you. Um, I know that we, I saw Rep Gonzalez here, and he may be on a time crunch. So, if it's okay with um, with Attorney Kirion, I'd like to take uh, I'd like to take the representative so we can get back to representing. <laughs> thank, you, Representative Gonzalez. Well, thank you, thank you for taking me at a turn, distinguished members of the Governor's Council and Lieutenant Governor. Thank you. Um, I know Senator Gomez could not be here today. Uh, but T uh, is a great champion of these efforts, and I want to um, just say that um, I'm going to ask for your support in advocating for Governor Healy's and Driscoll's um, pardon um, initiatives. I think that these pardons can uplift individuals, particularly those in Springfield and my communities, um, which have been burdened by past convictions given uh, them a chance to rebuild their lives. And I think it's important and critical that Massachusetts plays a significant role in doing that. Uh, removing uh, collateral consequences is a act of equity and justice. Uh, rectifying the systematic uh, injustices that have occurred in the past criminal justice in the criminal justice system. Uh, by supporting these partners, we drive positive change and create opportunities for individuals to contribute to our community. And uh, let us imagine that transformation, what can occur when someone is given a second chance. Uh, and we get that by um, asking the Lord to forgive our sins in many occasions. Uh, we need your support to amplify our message of one Massachusetts where equity is an opportunity and second chances are afforded. Uh, together, we can create a change and advance equity. Uh, please join the governor and many of the legislators and the advocates, like the one that just spoke before me, uh, for these changes. I thank you for giving me the opportunity to say a few words. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Gonzalez. Uh, Councilmember Kennedy. Um, the about is really trying to get it really up to the judge. Mm -hmm. Automatic. I don't think that will take legislation. Mm -hmm. I think you should take it back to the House representatives and consider uh, if you have problems. Uh, mm -hmm. Seeking some legislation that would cure the issues that have been raised in terms of it still being in the record even with the fact. I think this is a great first step to find. Mm -hmm. So I think we folks that would do something to take it for the next step. Yeah. And I think that's a discussion that's already on the table. I we need to continue to uh, voice our concerns as well as uh, the opportunities that we will provide all residents of Massachusetts because we want to turn individuals that are tax burdens into taxpayers, and we can do that by affording them an opportunity to work and be employed and get how appropriate housing. We would be 100% and I thank you for coming today. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Any other questions from council members? Councilor Jacobs? I just want to thank you for stepping in at the last minute and being here. I really appreciate everything you shared, and I, I agree this is a this is a step towards equity and justice and second chances. And I know Springfield and Holyoke and, and other um, across the state, but that's in my district. Um, you know, there's there's a, a large community that will be positively impacted, and I appreciate you coming and, and sharing with us today. So thank you for just jumping in at the last minute. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor. Any others? All right. Thank you, Rep. Gonzalez. Always good to see you. Appreciate you being here. Next up is Attorney Pauline. Am I saying you're in my carry on? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Thank you for your indulgence in allowing us to go out of order. Appreciate that. Hi, everybody. I'm I'm Pauline Curian, and I'm the director of the 
Corey and Reentry Project at Greater Boston Legal Services, and we actually have the the oldest criminal record sealing project, you know, in the Commonwealth, which we started in 2008. And also before I started the project at GBLS uh, regarding sealing and expunging of records, I spent about 25 years also advocating for survivors of domestic violence. So I, I've seen both sides of, of litigation in, in, in terms of the, the criminal legal system. Um, I want to start out, though, um, by first thanking the governor for introducing this really extraordinary measure and initiative that we really need. And I also thank the governor's council in advance and hope you will uh, you know, support this measure because it really will help to right many of the wrongs uh, you know, all across the state. And so many people have suffered for, lo for so long because of these old cannabis uh, offenses. And uh, Councillor Kennedy hit, hit, hit the nail on the head in terms of the, the, the piecemeal approach not working. I often say that my work on a daily basis, which is filing petitions in court, filing petitions with the commission or probation, um, and helping people in that way, oftentimes the, the help is too late. They lost the affordable apartment, um, they lost the dream job, or they couldn't get into school or a training program. Um, and, and so the, the, the piecemeal system just doesn't work. That's why across the country, there's a movement to actually automate record sealing in general. Um, so that, um, it just happens and then people then, uh, and studies show that, you know, if your record is sealed, um, wages go up as well as your opportunity to get a job. So again, it's more tax revenue. It's more workers for the workforce. It's a, it's a win win uh, for everybody. And that thing to keep up in mind is in terms of the definitions, when we're talking about expungement, we're talking about uh, destruction of all the records. So that's a lot more complicated because there may be immigrants who need those records and they won't be able to show ICE that the case ended favorably if you go ahead and automatically destroy the records. So it's, it, it, there, there are some differences in terms of the relief, but. Um, I th this pardon has to do with, um, you know, marijuana offenses in particular, and it's it's quite fabulous because on a regular basis, I was thinking I was in my office yesterday, and I had a bunch of Corys, you know, at least, at least uh, thirty percent of them had some old cannabis charge, um, you know, that really could have been dealt with a long time ago, and is still uh, is still sitting there. Um, and then, you know, there's no right to counsel in terms of sealing or expungement. So what the governor is doing is quite quite extraordinary in terms of access to justice, because I feel like I shovel the sand against the tide on a daily basis. It's not enough, and I have cohorts across the state try to do the same. But even in some parts in southeastern Mass, there's no one to help you seal your criminal record. So there's only a dearth of services, and it's spotty. We we have to turn people away. We we can't do all this work. So the the beauty of this uh, proposed system is it just happens. Um, and then you're the beneficiary, and um, and as as was was recently pointed out in, in testimony, um, what happens too is some jobs um, subject you to a fingerprint check, so you could have sealed all your records, but it's going to come back, and they're going to find out that you have the record, and so you're going to have to deal with that. Whereas if you've got this pardon certificate, then the the, the clemency guidelines are very clear, so that means it's it's uh, not to be used against you, and it's it's uh, not it's not a basis for an exclusion or a disqualification for a job. And there are certain entities, for example, if you wanted to work in child care or anything licensed by the Department of Early Education and Care, we've had experiences with people with delinqu uh, dismissed delinquency offenses where they couldn't get a job twenty years later because of this old offense dogging them. So it doesn't really uh, matter what the offense is. Um, any offense on your record is, is um, you know, gotta be an impediment to employment and to real second chances. And then the, the last thing I'd like to point out before uh, closing is to say that you have to also think about a lot of people who, um, uh, you know, may need to uh, uh, get a pardon or seal or expunge offenses. A lot of them are survivors of domestic violence and they have, you know, they've been criminalized and they have these offenses on their records, but it can be just traumatic having to go back to the courthouse and reliving uh, some of those experiences. So um, I would urge uh, the governor's council 
you know, to please uh, pass this measure because it's really going to be a big help. Uh, obviously, uh, as was indicated uh, by Councillor Kennedy and others, and maybe other similar measures that that could also be enacted down the road. But for now, this this is really fantastic in terms of the the people I see in my daily work. Thank you, Attorney Carrion. Appreciate you being here and the work you're doing. Any questions from members of the council? Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Jacobs. You know, thank you for that. I I appreciate it. I appreciate all the work you're doing, and I I appreciate the the framing around the access to justice aspect of this, where there's not assistance and 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 delving into what can be a burdensome and confusing and traumatic, to your point, um, process uh, of uh, you know having to go back to the court to ask for expungement. Um, I guess I, I've heard a lot today, and maybe maybe I don't need to be asking this question now, but I, I would love to hear your. Your framing of it just to really put a, a bow on the difference between um, so when we expunge and it's it's wiped, but when it's pardoned, it remains there on the record saying pardon. So if I were to have a Cory check run and I have this on my record and there's a pardon next to it, um, I guess just your 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 thoughts around if you know if I'm if I'm um, an administrator in a school running a quarry check and I see that I may still judge that person for seeing this convicted, but then pardoned. I may ignore the party. You know what I mean? Like it's pardoned, but I still know that it happened. Well, I think I think the pardon is is probably a superior form of relief to just a garden variety ceiling. Mm -hmm. Um because I mean the 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 uh the clemency guidelines are explicit. They say at first a pardon has the effect of Treating the petitioner as if the offense has never been committed, um, and there's also a, a provision in the sealing law that says uh, once you've sealed your case, it, it's not a bar to an employment, public, public yeah. employment, or commissions or appointments. But uh, to me, um, in ter terms of uh, what's the most comprehensive remedy, it's it's uh, the pardon. I think that's going to fill a hole for a lot of people who apply for federal jobs or they apply for uh, some job where I know I get Corey uh, checked all the time because I uh, supervise AmeriCorps employees. Mm -hmm. So anybody who has to get is subjected to like a fingerprint check. You seal all your stuff, but then it's still in the in the federal system. Um, it's in the FBI records. So, um, you know, it, it's it's going to keep appearing and the people may want to work for Homeland Security or join the military or do something along those lines. But if they've got the pardon certificate, you know, then, then they can show that. But, you know, but there's gonna be this conversation which will be awkward. Where at least now we can also coach people to say, you know, make sure you show that pardon certificate, make a lot of copies of it. Um, and then, you know, you can use it, you know, in your employment. Um, but realistically, um, people aren't going to necessarily, uh, they're gonna kind of seek expungement because, um, you know, we do expungements for people and, uh, and, uh, you know, in general, because it means, uh, schlepping to court, um, and the courts could actually do the, the, the expungements on the papers when we file them, but for the most part, they want to see the person there. So mm -hmm. it, it is somewhat of a deterrent. And then if somebody's in an unstable situation, which means they probably need this relief more than other folks. You know, it's it's sort of this vicious circle. So this is this is quite fabulous in terms of this automatic approach, and we ought to just be using the a mod automatic approach more frequently, maybe in other contexts. But uh, but in terms of what's before the council for today, it's it's really incredible. Thank you, Councilor DePaulo. Thank you for being here. I'm going to put you with the same question I asked the district attorney, and I I'm not asserting that there is an answer. But you're on the ground and you're working with people who are facing barriers on this particular issue. Are there other issues that you feel are creating barriers for people, whether it's in employment, housing, education, or otherwise, um, where some kind of action, whether by the governor's office or by the legislature, would uh, align justice more with contemporary standards? Um, well, I, I suppose if, if you wanted, I, I think I suggested earlier, you could. Uh, make a list, uh, though it's it's sort of even hard to figure out all the, the laws that have been, all the offenses that have been, be, be, uh, that have been decriminalized over the years, because I do sort of have my own list, and I always feel like it's not, certainly not comprehensive, 
Uh, so, uh, so you could, but there are things that are, that are decriminalized, like, uh, uh, having a hypodermic needle was decriminalized, um, being in the presence of heroin or drug was decriminalized so that people could call for assistance if somebody, um, OD'd, um, for juveniles in as part of the 2018 reform, there was, um, decriminalization of disruption of a school assembly or disturbing the peace at a school if you were a student at the time. Um, so, so there may be other offenses and then there's, then there's the whole group of kids who had uh, juvenile cases in the juvenile court because the, the juvenile age was raised to age 12 in 2018. But before that, it, it was actually, believe it or not, it was age seven. So they dismissed all of those cases. So you've got all these kids who have juvenile records, but in, in essence, by raising the age of the juvenile court, if the the offense was decriminalized, like, like you're too young to have committed the crime. So that's a group of people, um, and I would assume they'd be findable because they're not so old uh, necessarily. Um, but, but there are groups of, um, Groups of offenses, I think that uh, in terms of pardon relief, you could do a, a huge a bunch of them at, at the same time. Because um, eventually, those those kids who are probably still young now, you know, eventually they're going to be dealing with their record. Because we we find people come in, you know, sometimes they come in when they're they're forty years old, um, having to do with a like a, they want to work in childcare. Or they've got that dismissal, even though it was in the in the juvenile court. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I know that's peripheral to what we're here for today, but I, I really appreciate you giving us some food for thought based on your experience. Thank you. I think I see Councillor Devaney. Thank you. Um, I have a question about um, the closed record. Isn't it true that you don't know what's in that record? So how do they know if it's marijuana or some other offense? Oh, you mean when it's sealed? Yeah. Um, well, if you have a, there'll be certain types of employers that will have access to a sealed record because what it comes down to is when you seal your record most of the employers won't get access to them assuming it's a, a, a sort of a regular employer but then there are certain statutory exceptions so law enforcement and criminal justice agencies they get access to all sealed records so could an average employer get that no if, if, I, if i if somebody if, if i had some a client who applied for a job at a restaurant and the record to seal, it's probably not going to be a problem. Um, but if it was in the federal building in the cafeteria, then probably would be a problem. There'd be a, a but, background you know, check. I see it as a problem because the employer might think it's a much more dangerous criminal activity, and it wasn't. But it's sealed, and they'll never know whether it was a rape, attempted murder, or marijuana, or whatever. And I, that's the thing that concerns me that um, someone uh, wouldn't be considered for a job because of the sealed record. So it doesn't always work in their favor. Well, it, it, it's, it's uh, well, generally sealing is probably going to be helpful, but you'll have those situations because there, there's a set of statutory exceptions for certain types of employment, like having to do with early education and child care jobs Not where by a department police department right yeah. but but and but there is a myth out there that all employers will know there's a sealed record because there's an s on the report that's totally untrue so um but but sealing sealing has its limits or if for some reason you were in the newspaper the boston globe has a program to uh get rid of the online information about your offense but you know the patriot ledger does not and all other a lot of newspapers all over the place. So there's going to be, we're, we're dealing with lots and lots of people here. So there's going to be lots of exceptions. So people definitely need this help. In your position, what's the average age that you say? Well, people are, are all uh, ages. Pretty much we see mostly adults um, uh, that we, we do some juvenile sealing. Once in a while, we see some uh, teenagers. I don't but, mean sealing. I mean your position in general, who you see. That you mean the clients? Yeah, the clients. The age is all over the place. Oh. We, we have people who are applying for elder housing, which is a motivating housing and employment are the major reasons people see us. We have other people; they just want to spend time. Uh, they want to volunteer at their kids' school, and they can't. They may come to us uh, 
for assistance with that. And then the employers are going to vary. Some of them, you know, they may use cannabis themselves and it's not a big deal, but then you have may, may uh, have a, an employer who, you know, uh, stereotypes people because of, of it. So it's, it's going to be, but the people are all over the place. I've never thought of what the, the average age is because I see people who are young and this whole thing. Thank you. I had no idea. Okay. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Jacobs. Thank you. So this particular pardon for simple possession, is that only for specifically marijuana, the weed itself or paraphernalia? Is that included? No, it's just, uh, this is just for possession offenses. There are other statutes that are in existence, like, for example, anything that's decriminalized, you can send in a petition and they'll seal it without a waiting period. And then if you have uh, anything that's decriminalized, not just uh, cannabis, um, you can also um, expunge those, which is the record dis um, uh, destruction, which um, which also can include if you had a district, if you were overcharged with distribution as well. and it and it arose out of the same incident. So it's a little more complicated because in terms of having to review the record when you when you were in the expungement context, but you can also expunge those uh, distribution offenses. And I've also expunged some um, school zone offenses because the person just had some minuscule amount of marijuana and they were in the wrong place and then they were overcharged. Um, and then the, the, the school zone law changed in 2018. So mere possession isn't, is 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 uh, it, it, it the, the offense itself has changed. So we've been able for people who just were in possession, but were charged uh, with a school zone events. We've actually been able to expunge those, but it is more complicated because you've got to be able to explain the law to the judge. So we're we're talking about it's not that it's apples and oranges, but some some of these uh, some of these are more complicated than others, but. You know, this situation, though, is a no brainer in terms of marijuana uh, convictions when we have something that's now legalized. So it's it's really unfair to have something on your record when it's not a crime. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I don't see questions from any other members. Thank you so much, Attorney Kerry, and appreciate you being here and the work well, that you're doing. Thank you. I know we have one remote witness, Mr. Ron Ikabuchi. Ron, are you on? Can... Ron, yes, you are. There we go. Governor. Okay, we can see you. Maybe you might want to speak up just a little bit. Okay, let me see if I could step in here. And I'm actually down in Carver with the governor right now on a workforce development uh, matter, which excellent. is uh, which is excellent. And I just want to say for the record that I do very much applaud here. Um, it's going to make a difference. And I don't want to repeat anything that's been said. I've got written testimony that's in, but I want to underscore the importance of workforce development in what we're doing here. Um, I oversee uh, the publicly funded workforce system in the South Shore, and I know the impact that this has on the lives of many people that come through our doors. We have job seekers, we have employers, and, and this criminal record is something that really makes a big difference. Uh, it sounds like from everything I've listened to, uh, today that um, clearly uh, there's more work to be done uh, because I think uh, Councillor Kennedy hit it right on the head. If we don't remove it from the record, it still becomes an issue with some of these people that we're dealing with and we're trying to put into jobs. So there's more work to be done, I think, relative to that. The only other thing I wanted to add was um, maybe the importance of consulting with the State Ethics Commission to avoid any potential conflicts here. Uh, we could be granting counselors, could be granting pardons to people that are family members, to people that are business associates, to people that have contributed to them. So I think we want to be very careful that we do this right. But it is absolutely the right thing to do, and I applaud the governor's courage in doing this. It will make a tremendous difference for the work we do in mass hire and putting people into jobs. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to. Thank you, Mr. Ikabuchi. I think you timed out just at the right time. <laughs> All right, perfect. Adam, do we have any additional witnesses? None. Okay. I'd like to um, certainly before we close the hearing, give each of the counselors an opportunity to be heard if they wish. Uh, beginning on my left, um, Councilor Duff, I don't know if you have any additional I have no questions. comments or uh, questions you'd like to make. No, thank you, Lo Okay. 
Councillor Kennedy, any additional comments you'd like to make as we close up the hearing? No, I once again, I commend the governor for uh, this patent. I think it is a great first step. Uh, hopefully we, we go further, but it's a great first step. Appreciate that. Councillor Gapala? Uh, I just commend, continue to commend the governor and you, Lieutenant Governor, and your administration for this uh, move. And I appreciate the witnesses who are here today giving us some ideas about uh, how we can continue this trend. Councillor Jacobs? Yeah, I guess I'll just echo my fellow councillors. I think um, we all appreciate the, the steps towards clemency this administration has taken out of the gate and ongoingly. And I think this is a really great first step. And I, I, I have full faith in, in your dedication towards second chances and, and racial equity and, and justice in general that we'll see more. And I'm sure to that. Thank you. Councillor Ferreira? I just want to thank the governor, lieutenant governor, for having this hearing and for giving people an opportunity because it is historic. We, no one has ever done this in the history of the nation that I know of. A blanket pardon for you know uh, for all these um, marijuana convictions. So I I thought it was essential that we know we'll give people an opportunity maybe to bring to um, our knowledge anything that we don't know about or have questions about. So I think it's good that it was fully vetted, and I appreciate that. Thank you, Councillor Devaney. Um, I want to thank everybody who testified. I had made a motion to vote on this at a previous meeting for the pardon, and uh, the council chose not to take the vote then. I felt we could vote and then have this discussion on how it's going to be um, implemented. But I think there was a lot of things that came up today that has to be looked into, and, uh, but um, I think this pattern should have been March 13th. That's my opinion, so thank you. Thank you, Councillor Devaney. Uh, Councillor Ayanella? Yeah, I just want to uh, thank the governor, Lieutenant Governor, uh, and I'm in full support of the uh, pilots. Terrific. Thank you, Councillors, and thank you to all the witnesses. Can I take one more thing? I want to say that uh, what this governor has done, I mean, this is nationwide, first time ever, and this is a message to people out there that this administration believes in second chances, and that's the, that is the biggest message that this administration has sent. Thank, Thank you, you. Councillor Devaney. We're excited about the opportunity for thousands of residents to have their records clear of a charge that is now no longer illegal. So as we wrap up, I want to thank the councillors for being here at the hearing, our witnesses who participated. We look forward to the council's vote on this pardon later this afternoon, and this will conclude our hearing. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.